Hey guys, I just wanted to say thank you for all the support in the previous video, and because many of you asked for a run through of the design, I'll be showing you how I built this custom ESP32 S3 development board in KiCad 7. I'll also be showing you just how easy it is to order complicated boards like this from this channel sponsor, PCBWay, but more on that later. Oh, and before we jump straight into the schematic, I just wanted to let you guys know that if you aren't subscribed already, please do because in my next video I'll be incorporating this board into my best line follower yet. As you can see, we just have this main ESP32 S3 chip right here with an integrated 8 megabytes of PS RAM. And I've just labeled all of these pins here using the L key so I can make connections to them later. Also, I'm not using UART, so I left that disconnected, even though the guidelines don't really recommend for you to do that. And I was too scared to use the JTAG pins as GPIOs. IO33 to 37 are also taken up by the Octo PS RAM, so I couldn't use those either. Here we have the 0 ohm jumper resistors out of the pins of the ESP32 S3, which I guess are meant to mitigate a couple issues, like RF interference, timing, and driving current. They simply just root into the pins of the chip. I'm using the W25Q128JVP-IQ in the WSON8 package. And I've also added a pull up here on the chip select zero pin so that the flash is clearly enabled or disabled by the ESP32 S3 chip. Of course, there's also got to be some filtering before the 3.3 volt supply reaches the chip. And here are all the components you need, which are straight from the hardware guidelines. Basically, just some decoupling capacitors to make the power supply more stable and an LC inductor capacitor circuit to suppress harmonics. Something that I feel needs to be included in every ESP32 S3 design, or at least every working one, is a boot button at the very least, and an optional reset button. This RC circuit here delays power up of the chip so that the power rails can stabilize before startup and this 10K one microfarad combination is pretty solid and used in most designs. In case you didn't know, clicking the boot button lets the chip know that you want to download a program, and clicking the reset button simply powers off the chip. The boot button is connected to GPIO0, meaning that it doubles as a user button after reset. Now my power circuit on this board is actually more simple than you'd expect, mainly because I didn't include a LiPo charging IC, and instead opted for voltage regulators that could handle much more voltage than the ones normally included in ESP32 boards. You see, just like most Arduinos, I wanted to be able to plug in USB, or a multi-cell LiPo, or both, with this wide range of inputs all being regulated down to 3.3 volts for the ESP32. This is because I like to make moving robots, like line followers, which often require that higher voltage from the LiPos to run the DC motors. Luckily, the TOV767DRV series can handle up to 16 volts in a 2x2mm package and will either output an adjustable voltage or a fixed one at 1 amp. Keep in mind though, after some testing, I realized these TLV767 regulators actually get concerningly hot when plugged into 12 volts, so I'm not sure if I could recommend them to you guys. Anyways, they still worked in everything, and I only need a small output capacitor, and an even smaller input capacitor to get them running. The voltage in pins which will connect to a multi-cell LiPo are broken out on these double headers, which I'll explain later. Now what's the second power input? Of course, it's the USB port, which will give us a nice steady 5 volts, something that doesn't make the audio as hot. I chose Type-C since it's the standard nowadays, and I just need to add these 5.1K pull-down resistors on both CC pins to negotiate for 5 volts, add up to 3 amps. This is an absolute must for USB-C, so if you make your own design, make sure to add these pull-downs if you only want 5 volts. So VBUS goes through a shocky diode to the voltage in pin to prevent nasty things from happening. 
And as you might be noticing, I have a fair load of ESD protection on this board. First, there's a TVS diode on the voltage in pin, since that makes a lot more physical contact, as there's a battery that will be plugged in. Next, there's this USB LC6 2P6 ESD protector to protect the USB port itself. And I actually learned about this part from Unexpected Maker's Pro S3 schematic. Make sure to check it out if you want to learn some more from an actually professional person. I'll link it in the description. Next, we got this crystal here with a series resistor to reduce harmonics and some load capacitors which you can calculate the value of using this equation. This crystal actually seems to be quite small compared to Espressif's own design, but it still ended up working pretty nicely because it was obviously 40 MHz. Audio 2 is basically the same as the main audio, same part number and decoupling, but it powers the magnetic buzzer and NeoPixel LED instead, which is what I'll be talking about next. Now this buzzer, the CMT052575, SMT TR, quite a nice name there, draws up to 200 milliamps, definitely not the same as a standard buzzer, which can just be powered directly from an IO pin. So I had to end up using an NPN transistor here, which is switching the low side of the buzzer. Basically, one of these pins always has a 3.3 volt supply, but the circuit only completes when ground is connected with this NPN transistor. We of course have the same shocky diode that I use on the USB port here to protect the load against reverse voltage and a series resistor from the base to the corresponding IO pin for the buzzer so that we don't get free pollution and toxins seeping out of the transistor. You may be asking now, how will the ESP32 S3 have RF capabilities without an antenna? Well, here's the antenna. It's a 2.4 GHz chip antenna, which I use because it's way smaller. And well, I don't know how to implement a PCB antenna yet. So from the LNA in pin of the ESP32, there's this first matching circuit here to match the 35 plus J0 ohms output impedance of the ESP32 to 50 plus J0 ohms, the standard value as input to an RF antenna. And then this second matching circuit here to match the antenna to 50 ohms, which I've left as just a zero ohm resistor at the moment because I don't have a VNA unfortunately, and the data sheet of the antenna provided no example values. I calculated this first matching circuit with a Smith chart instead of one of these kind of calculators, since I can input real world values for the components in, instead of rounding from exact calculations and perhaps getting a worse match. Although the Q factor does need to be taken into consideration more with this method. The headers are just standard 2.5mm pitch, but they have two rows, so that more GPIOs can fit in the space that I've given myself. That unfortunately means that it is not breadboard compatible, and it isn't perfboard compatible either since I messed up the spacing. Alright, it's that easy to make the schematic for your very own ESP32 S3 development board. Let's move on to the PCB design now. Now, I would like to say that I did this programmatically, but that just wouldn't be true. I placed the components and started routing a couple times before realizing my component placement or footprints were bad, and then starting all over again. But this is what I ended up with. So as you can see on this top layer right here, we have the GPIOs from the chip going straight to these double row headers. And I think it looks pretty cool the way that a bunch of PCB tracks piled together often do. Next, I did the differential pairs for USB, which I calculated using PCBWay's online and peanuts calculator, and found that I needed a trace width of 0.2 millimeters and also a gap of 0.2 millimeters, which made things pretty easy. And I know some of you might bug me about the fact that it isn't completely surrounded by a ground plane, but I honestly don't care. The overall length between these two differential pairs is literally one centimeter, or 0.4 inches, which is pretty big, but not big enough to need complete adherence to the guidelines, unlike longer USB traces. Another instance of the you don't need to follow the rules if the traces are really, really short is here with the flash chip. 
It's quad SPI, literally the fastest signal on this board, apart from maybe the crystal, and I routed it between traces. Like you're definitely not supposed to do that either. But I saw Expressive do it in their own WROM module, so I figured it couldn't be that bad, and it turns out it wasn't, and I could upload at 921600 baud easily, which was a nice surprise. You also may notice that the flash chip isn't grounded through a trace. It's actually grounded through vias, which go to the ground planes on the layers below. Again, I'm pretty sure this isn't good practice, but it might not be too bad. I mean, after all, it did work completely fine. Next, we got this crystal right here. The most sacred part of the entire board. The part of it which could mess up almost every signal and the RF. And it was as simple as just isolating it from the top ground plane, using, again, grounding vias to the copper planes in the lower layers, as Espressif recommended in the design guidelines. There's not really much to add here when it comes to the buzzer or the buttons, as I kind of just routed them willy-nilly, only making sure that the traces were thick enough to handle the current. So the last part I'll be talking about for this board is the chip antenna. First, we have a keep out area here for the antenna to radiate better, and I followed Johansson Technologies datasheet for this one, and if you want to know, this is the 2450AT 18D0100 antenna. A keep out area is when no copper is allowed in a specific region of the board, and in this case, it affects all layers within the 4x6mm zone. Well, kind of. Obviously, the top layer still needs to have the traces rooted, so in those areas, there is an exception. The antenna matching network was placed pretty close to the antenna itself, and the chipset matching network was placed close to the chip. So we have this long curved trace that is hopefully matched to 50 ohms between the two. It's a coplanar waveguide type trace, which I calculated online using Commandy's calculator and it's curved because apparently sharp turns is bad for the performance. Keep in mind, via stitching, trace rounding, and some other RF capabilities like the ones I used are not available in the standard version of KiCad, and you'll have to download a package to add to it, which I'll link in the description below. Since I won't be tuning this antenna matching network though, it'll probably perform pretty badly, so I'll just have to hope it doesn't damage anything. So what are all these holes? In PCB design, especially in RF and microcontroller boards, you need to have grounded stitching vias all around the antenna feed line, as well as scattered amongst the board as much as possible, because this connects the four ground planes together and minimizes impedance for a turn current. Anyways, that's basically how I did it. So here's how I ordered it using PCB Way. First, I exported my Gerber file and uploaded it to the quick order page. Selecting the impedance control option, as well as how many layers I wanted, the color of the solder mask, and the copper finish, among other things. For the assembly, I needed to follow this simple PCB way bill of materials template, which I spent about 3 hours on because I didn't think to add the part numbers while making the schematic, and quite frankly, I still don't know how to. Silly me. Then I uploaded the bill of materials to the assembly section of the quick order page. I waited a day or so for them to review the file a process which only happens with more complicated boards like this one, and it turns out that I forgot to provide them the impedance information in the Gerber file. So I sent some pictures of the necessary tracks to be impedance matched, and they also spotted one error in my bill of materials, which I quickly clarified, and then they were ready to start manufacturing it. About a week later, I received it, and if you also want to get great quality PCBs, Make sure to sign up to PCB Way using the link in my description. Thanks for watching, guys.